Welcome to today's webinar, Aligning Your Marketing Tools for Better Digital Experiences. My name's Kate and I'm your host. Today's speakers are Mark Villiers, who's the CEO of Accelerate, and Ariane Vandenacker, who's a, the Product Marketing Director here at SDL. We're expecting today's webinar to last around 35 to 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. If you have any questions during this webinar, then please pop them in the um, ask a question um, box in the um, Q&A tab. Um, I'm now going to pass you over to Arian to begin the presentation. Thank you, Kate. And Mark, uh, thanks a lot for joining us here today as our guest speaker. I'm really uh, thrilled to have you here on our webinar today to talk about a special case uh, and also to provide the insights from Accelerate about uh, how you see companies uh, adopt marketing tools to construct uh, better digital experiences these days. Sure, so, very happy to be here, Arjen. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, sure we're going to hear a whole lot of interesting things from your end as uh, well, a partner of ours being out there in the field talking to customers on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I would like to start with here is a, is a statement from McKinsey, and this is really about basically how customer behavior is changing these days. And it's really about consumption these days rather than uh, having a physical property in your possession. So what people request these days is access to goods and services rather than necessarily owning them. And what we see happening as a result is this something that used to be products, actually turn into services these days. And those services connect consumers to one another. And they might have good things to say about you, they might have bad things to say about you, but those services actually create an ecosystem of customers around you that are talking to one another, and that's important to keep in mind. And to give an example of a typical shift that we can all relate to, let's look at this one. For instance, music. I know myself, I'm from a uh, yeah, let's say I have an age where I used to have physical CDs. Um, I actually am a bit older. I also had tapes and uh, vinyl records in the old days. But I was really the sort of guy that loved to have CDs here somewhere uh, stored and have the physical product in my hands. Well, later on that sort of shifted towards downloading, but I would still be somebody that had the MP3s on my computer stored or on a network access storage device. But if you look at the younger, younger generation, they really don't care about owning those, uh, those products anymore or even those MP3 files. The only thing they want, they want to be able to stream the music from whatever platform they prefer, Spotify, Deezer, Apple Music, what have you. And it, the whole thing of having a product actually turns into what is now being consumed as a service. And that's a big change in terms of how people are yeah, using products and also what it means in terms of how you deliver experiences to your customers. Because if you look at these services, at some point, they become interchangeable. Because when I play a song from platform A or platform B, it's still the same song. So what's the difference between using one platform or the other? Well, in the end, it's the experience that I'm having with that platform. Is it a good one? Is it smooth? Is it easy to set up? Um, is it performant? And that is, in the end, what makes me either a happy customer or a not satisfied customer of that service. So it's not just about delivering the service, it's about the experience you build around that service that is ultimately making the difference. And that's important to remember. Um, and if I look at this quote from Forbes again, they're talking about what is it that makes an experience memorable. Well, it needs to be personable, and it needs to be memorable in order for companies to acquire and retain clients. And that's not just something from the digital age. I mean, that's something that has been proven for, for many decades, is that customers become loyal customers if the experience resonates with them, if it makes sense, if they're not wasting their time. Uh, and that can be true in a physical store, but it is definitely true online where people are very impatient. So it means whatever you serve up to them needs to be relevant, it needs to be personal. Um, and the interesting part, of course, is if you think about digital experiences these days, they're all somehow driven by content. So let's keep that in mind for later on on this webinar. Now an experience that is memorable, hopefully it's a positive uh, experience, but this is also an experience that is quite memorable, but this may be the worst experience that you've ever had. I mean, this is a real website. You can see the URL here at the top, www.arngren.net. If you're curious, you can browse there and take a look for yourself. 
this is not what we mean by great digital experiences. It's surely memorable, but this is not how you acquire and retain customers, right? Now, looking at those experiences, there's an interesting research that we came across, and this is uh, an overview from 2016, 2017, where people were being asked about what is your experience with specific brands in specific industries. So you see a range of industries listed here on the vertical axis. And then you see how people rate their experience with companies within those industries. Now keep in mind, this is relative. So this is compared to the year before. And what is interesting to see here is that people think that, let's take the top one, air travel, and the one underneath, TV, broadband, that people are rating those experiences as getting worse. Now that's interesting because I'm sure that those companies have not made their digital experiences worse than before. Uh, but what it probably means is that people have higher expectations. And compared to those expectations, they rate those experiences as worse. So, and that is something to keep in mind. So you're not competing with, um, well, let's say the experience from last year. You're competing with the best experience that people are getting elsewhere. And we have another interesting piece of research that we uh, looked into from Forrester from 2018. It was an STL Commission research paper. And we saw that three quarters of customers say that brands need to meet up with the expectations set by the best digital experiences that these customers have elsewhere. So you're not competing with people in your own industry or brands in your industry. You're just competing with the best digital experiences people are having elsewhere. And that means this is a constantly evolving thing. It's a moving target. And you need to work really, really hard to make sure that you continue to meet those customer expectations and those digital experience expectations that customers are having. Now, again, back to what is the experience actually, um, what is it made up of? Ultimately, content is what drives the experience. Without Content, there is no experience. Yes, there is customer data that is involved in creating experience. There's all sort of technology involved. But in the end, the content is the thing that the customer would interact with. It's what they see on their screen or what they hear. It's what they consume. And 61%, this is another McKinsey stat, of customers that they're more likely to buy from companies delivering custom content. Now, we've been talking about personalization for ages, but this is still a very important statistic because people don't want to waste their time. If they're sitting somewhere on a website and they're being served up irrelevant content, they feel like I'm wasting my time here and they might move somewhere else. So custom content is something that is really important for those experiences. So here, Mark, I'd like to hand over to, for you to talk about those, uh, yeah, that relevancy about the experience and the content. So um, please, please take it over from here. Sure. Thank you, Arjen. So. We've discussed that experiences that are personal and memorable can help acquire and retain clients, and that we need to deliver custom content. Now let's explore this further. We believe that experiences are all about increasing contextual relevancy while retaining authenticity. And if we look at authenticity first, whenever you talk to a person in real life and you feel that that person is not very authentic, well, you're probably not going to like this person very much. And it works the same way with online interactions. So you want to be authentic in the way you approach your customers. And a big part of authenticity is to make sure that you, you offer the content in a native language of your visitor. But you also need to be relevant. There's no point in trying to push content that is completely different to what a customer is expecting or, or looking for. But relevancy needs to go even further. It needs to be contextually relevant to a specific moment in time and to that specific visit. Now, a good example to elaborate on contextual relevancy is a hotel booking. And let's take an example from an airline that wants to upsell hotel bookings as ancillary products after a customer has booked a flight. Here's a real life example of such a hotel description that is pushed by an airline. Now the airline uses standard Expedia hotel descriptions in this case for their offering. And it was the hotel offering actually for when I was booking a flight to, a, to Las Vegas for a conference. And although the airline knows who is going to travel 
and when he's traveling and what the composition of the traveling party is and maybe even what the reason for the travel is, they still provide a hotel description that is the same as in any other situation. So this example is not contextually relevant. It shows me a map, but I have no idea how this is situated from the airport or any other place I know. Therefore, the map is meaningless in itself. And the first two amenities are about free self-parking and free valet parking, although I'm coming in with a taxi or, or maybe an Uber. And then it goes on about a spa, a casino, a fitness center, and a poolside bar. Well, I don't know about your business trips, but usually these are the parts of a hotel that I don't have the luxury of seeing the inside of during my business trips. So this all doesn't contribute to me booking this hotel for my trip. Now, how about a contextually relevant description? Here's an example of how they could have done a better job. It makes more sense. It provides me a map to show where the hotel is situated from the airport. Remember, I'm traveling by plane, so the airport is my point of origin. And traveling on a business trip, I have multiple devices with me that need charging. So it provides me a specific amenity that was referenced in the reviews of the hotel. Wi-Fi is free and super fast and works everywhere, and the bedroom is full of plugs. And then based on my Twitter feed, they know I like steakhouses. So it provides me with that amenity in this specific hotel, including a rating from a third party, for instance, TripAdvisor. And then because it knows my flight times, it shows yet another amenity of, in this case, the late checkout, meaning I can stay in my hotel room until it's time to go to the airport. Now, this hotel description is contextually relevant. Utilizing the core data of the flights I've just booked and extended with all kinds of third-party integrations like Uber costs, hotel reviews, and ratings. So we've already covered that your content needs to be authentic and that it needs to be relevant and specifically contextually relevant. This in itself needs to have you rethink your content that you deliver in your customer experiences. Uh, specifically making sure that all of your content reaches that contextually relevant state needs you to be constantly evaluating what data touch points you can integrate in your content to make it more relevant each time. But there's another one other aspect regarding the content that you need to rethink, and that is the rise of conversational UIs, uh, the chatbots and the wearables, for instance. These UIs increase the need to be very specific and to the point, because there's nothing more prone to have customers leaving than delivering non-relevant content, and that you need to sit there and wait for the chatbot to tell you all kind of non-relevant content. So you need to rethink how you become aware of the need of your customer and how you deliver that content to the customer in the quickest way possible. Only in that case, you will fully seize the opportunity. Being able to deliver contextually relevant content in an authentic way is the core focus of what Accelerate does. Now, we serve multinational companies that have a need to market locally, meaning global but with a local touch, in order to achieve that authenticity. And we've been in the game for more than 20 years and serve over 20 Fortune 1000 customers. We provide strategy services with an agnostic approach to advise on a marketing technology stack consisting of best-of-breed solutions for a specific customer with a specific need. In other words, also our solutions are contextually irrelevant in a way. And then we are able to implement this marketing technology stack and deliver ongoing support with our operation services. One of our valued customers is Turkish Airlines. We've been serving them for several years, and as you may or may not know, Turkish Airlines actually flies to the most countries of any airline in the world, and they are a gigantic hub for flights to all parts of the world. They are quickly becoming the largest airline in the world with year-over-year -year growth in number of passengers and revenue, and with that growth and their ambition, they invest heavily into their customer experience delivery. 
when Turkish Airlines started their implementation projects, their needs were not very different than any other company at that time. They also wanted to, to, want to go global while going local at the same time, and they also wanted to do heavy personalization in the experience they delivered. The Turkish Airlines case is an example of a company trying to reach an authentic and contextually relevant customer experience by aligning their marketing tools in such a way that they can use data touch points to decide what content to serve to their visitors. And their content, content stack consisted of enterprise content management, translation management for authenticity purposes, and a native personalization engine to increase relevancy. But they needed to have this at scale, with over 250 websites in 120 countries in almost 30 languages. And in order to achieve this, we implemented SDL Tridian as their content hub, tightly integrated with SDL TMS for managing translations, SDL Media, Media Manager for storing images, and SDL Smart Targets for managing personalization. And after the implementation, they saw a tremendous increase in traffic and conversions. Conversions went up with a more than decent 20%, but traffic actually showed staggering results, especially in the Asian markets, with increases of traffic up to 200%. And this mainly has to do with being more authentic by having the experience available in the local language. And although SDL technology was a big part of their implementation, they went a step further and integrated different systems to improve the contextual relevance of their experience. Contributing to that 20% conversion increase was the data-driven personalization approach. Now, this means that they continuously combine multiple data points about a visitor out of more than 75 data touch points that they collect and utilize. And these data touch points consist of both explicit and implicit data, Ex explicit being, for instance, your name and your birth date, and implicit data being, for instance, the region you're in and the browser you use. And by segmenting their visitors into several buyer personas based on the data touch points and having multiple instances of content which are triggered by these data touch points, they were able to personalize their content all throughout the experience. And again, this content was also translated into the visitor's native language. The Turkish Airlines implementation is a good example of aligning marketing tools for a better digital experience. Turkish Airlines created a marketing technology stack with best of breed tools for different aspects of that experience. And in the example on this slide, Turkish Airlines is combining CMS, DAM, and CRM data together with a personalization engine to deliver an experience suitable for different channels. In the bottom left, you can see part of the user data gathered on the visitor, and it's stored and retrieved from the CRM. And to the right, you see a functional description of the personalization engine on what is called the award ticket component. And it shows you the triggers and rules for different combinations that lead to the actual content shown to the visitor. And this content is a combination of both content coming from the CMS and assets retrieved from the digital asset management system. And for every component of their digital experience, they have defined these descriptions, enabling them to achieve better contextual relevancy. Back to you, Arjen. Yeah, thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Quite an interesting case here. So what, what strikes me when I look at the diagram that you were just showing is there are a lot of different systems that are being used there. And that sort of leads me into the next part of this presentation, which is really about the alignment of all those different marketing tools, which was in the title of this webinar, for creating those better digital experiences. And one of the things we see across the board is that what we call interoperability is a really key theme for, for the solutions to be able to work this way. So let's explore this a little bit further. First of all, some of you may know this slide, but for those of you who are not familiar with it, you might think, well, what is this? It looks like white noise almost. But this is a slide 
It's created by Scott Brinker every year, and it shows all the marketing tools out there. And this is the one from 2019. It was issued in April, so it's really, really uh, brand new. And there's a staggering number of over 7,000 vendors out there, and all of the logos are on here. So I'm sure you'll have to zoom in quite drastically to see which vendors are where. But you see they're sort of split across columns, marketing automation, content, analytics, e-commerce, etc. And within those, there's all these different vendors that have some sort of marketing technology product that you might want to deploy in your own environment. Now, clearly, this is a staggering number, and at the same time, we also see it grow year after year. I'm not sure what the number exactly was last year, but we see almost see a thousand new names appear over a period of one year. And of course, names drop off, or vendors are being acquired. So actually, the, the number of new entrants is even higher than that. Now, this is quite an interesting slide to look at, just to understand the scope of the, um, the marketing technology ecosystem out there. Um, but what does that mean in terms of how you implement your marketing technology stack? Now, to, to figure that out, um, we worked with Digital Clarity Group last year, and they conducted a piece of research where they were looking into buyer trends and preferences and strategies for organizations in terms of how they are buying DXP technology, Digital Experience Platform Technology. Do they follow a sweet approach? Would they like to buy something from a single vendor because it's all, it looks in the demo at least, it's all connected? Or are they pursuing a strategy where they buy individual tools and then they stitch them together, either through a partner or maybe they have IT in-house that can do so? And it turns out that the majority of organizations are actually following that approach, which is called by Digital Parity Group a heterogeneous approach. So it means they buy best-of-breed technology from multiple vendors, and then they stitch them together somehow. And um, they also ask them, so what is the key reason that you prefer to work with these best of breed software vendors rather than buying it all from a single vendor? And what you can see here is the top reason uh, being uh, shown here with 55% is people say, say, well, this market, this digital experience market, it's so, it's so fast and it's so rapidly changing it's unrealistic for any sort of vendor to provide a single platform that can do everything for us. So there's no other option for us but to go out and buy technology from multiple vendors. Uh, that's the only viable option. And the second one also, we don't believe any single vendor has all the solutions we need at the level of quality and support that we require. So that means it looks like in order to build an ecosystem of technology that works together, you almost have to, there's, there's no way around going for a heterogeneous approach. You might still have multiple tools from a single vendor, but there are always going to be other technologies from other vendors in that same ecosystem. At the same time, it's also a good thing if you think about it from a vendor lock-in perspective, that you're not relying on a single vendor to provide all the technology. And then if one of the components doesn't suit your needs, you're stuck with that vendor because it's proprietary or you're locked in. So it's also from that perspective a good way to think about uh, getting technology from multiple vendors and then integrating them. And this is an interesting quote from one of the companies that Digital Clarity Group interviewed for this uh, report. And one of the people interviewed said, well, if the enterprise platform vendors have their way, they will be the Uber DXP. But the future will be a federated environment, not one single DXP, but several platforms together to provide those digital experiences. And that's a really interesting word, I think, to remember, a federated environment. And that is also what we see ourselves within our customer base. They have federated environments. And as a result, they can quite easily swap out one element in their marketing technology stack for another without doing a major overhaul of everything. And that makes it much more agile as a business to adopt new technologies or to experiment and also to swap out a tool if it doesn't do the job anymore that you uh, yeah, require it to do. Now, going back to this slide that Mark was showing earlier on of uh, the ecosystem at, um, at Turkish Airlines, What's interesting here, if you look at the boxes in a little bit more detail, in the bottom left you see uh, content, DEM system. On the bottom right you see customer data, CRM. Then there's content sitting in the middle, there's personalization underneath, and then more at the top there is web commerce and service. It goes towards the sort of experience tier, and then at the top you see the actual channels that are being used to, to get to that content. And then on the left and the right there's business intelligence, insights, analytics, 
and containing and marketing automation sits all, also in the middle layer here. So you see a whole bunch of different types of technologies and tools that are quite likely not being uh, delivered by one single vendor. And certainly for Turkish Airlines, that's indeed the case. But how do you make sure that all these systems can then work together? Well, this is something that Forrester refers to as connective tissue, such as APIs. But to have a digital experience platform and to connect these systems together, you need to make sure that those tools have proper APIs or proper ways of integrating with one another. And that is a key element of any DXP these days. Because if you're not following this approach, you will end up with products that are siloed and that cannot connect to other systems. And that means that either you have to re-enter information or copy and paste it across. There's going to be more manual effort involved. And it's also quite likely that your experience will be less optimal because, yeah, that system is not integrated with the rest of your marketing technology ecosystem. So it's a very important thing to remember that if you are going out there to select technology, is that you look at to what extent does it have APIs? Is it well documented? How mature is it? Is there expertise out there that knows how to, uh, yeah, how to build something on top of the platform? Are there service providers or partners that know the technology that can help me integrate it with the rest of my marketing tool set? And then, of course, yeah, does it have the right APIs and the right technologies to do so? I mean, uh, hopefully, you can go beyond batch import and export and have more real-time integrations uh, based on RESTful APIs or other types of uh, more modern contemporary uh, web standards. Now, and if you're building such an ecosystem, the other interesting question you can ask yourself is, okay, is there a sort of hub? Is there a central system that I need to yeah, work with, and then I'm going to build the rest of the tool set around that central system? And if we sort of conceptualize the previous slides, you can wonder, okay, is that the data system where my CRM or customer data is being stored, or maybe other types of external data or content? Is it more the transactional side of the system? So especially in e-commerce environments, of course, there's a heavy transactional element. Is that the sort of yeah, center, epicenter of my technology ecosystem? Would it be more like the content systems, the CMS that is uh, delivering all the content? Or is it actually the technology that I deploy to create the actual experience? So this could be the web application or some sort of web delivery tier where you could glue together different backend systems and create a joint experience. Now, there's not a single right answer, but what we see in the majority of cases, and that is also what we believe STL is in many cases the right approach, is that the content system, the CMS, will be the backbone, will be the hub of your digital experience platform. And if you think about it, it actually makes sense because an experience is driven by content. Without data, you can still create an experience. Maybe it's a one-size-fits-all. It might not be that relevant and contextual, but still you have an experience. The same is true for the transaction. I mean, you could strip out your e-commerce capabilities or transactions. It might be not a great experience, but you would still have a digital experience. But without content, the whole digital experience comes to a standstill. There is no experience without content. So we do see that in many cases and many implementations, the content systems are the hub of such an ecosystem. And also, there are the systems that are traditionally always have been involved already in delivering that experience. So it makes sense to make it the hub of that ecosystem. Now, if you look at how you can do that, so let's look in a bit more detail about the content management system. If you think about the customer data, it really means you need to integrate your content management system, and hopefully there are connectors or some pluggable mechanism to connect into leading systems like Salesforce or Microsoft Dynamics and marketing automation systems. But remember that these integrations not only need to happen at the back end in the authoring environment, but also at the front end because you might want to serve up a form on the website and then the leads or the captured information needs to go back to the Salesforce. So it's not just a back-end integration, it's also an integration at the front end, either on the web app or some sort of mobile app or other touch points that is involved. Same is true here for um, the transactional element. So let's assume that there is e-commerce or a PIM system involved where you have a lot of product information and transactional capabilities. That needs to be integrated as well. And again, that applies both to the back end of the CMS as well as the front end. 
So on the back end, it could mean that you give editors the ability, so CMS editors, the ability to browse the product repository and select certain products on your PIM system, for instance, or another backend system, and uh, combine those with other marketing-driven content on a single page or in a single experience. So that's the backend integration. But also at the front end, you want to make sure that the experience and the transaction can happen at the front end and people see the correct stock levels, if they want to purchase an item, etc. So interoperability for your CMS at the front and the back end is, is key. Now, how does that content management system talk to that front end experience tier? That's another interesting part to look at. And if we go 10, 15 years back, it's almost 20 years back now with the first CMSs, a lot of them were actually decoupled, meaning that the authoring environment was decoupled from the delivery tier. Then later on, we saw stronger coupling between the CMS and the actual delivery tier, where in some cases it's even hard to separate them out. Uh, but we see a trend back towards what is now called headless, an API-first, an API-driven way of, of connecting your content to the front end to the delivery tier. And that's really also what is required these days. So luckily, those systems that were decoupled traditionally, uh, they have no real issues with uh, serving up this type of content in this new scenario. Uh, but the systems that were designed as, as integrated front and back end systems, they struggle with this approach. Based on those APIs, you can then serve a content to your digital touch points, whatever that may be, mobile apps, web apps, kiosks at the airports, uh, in car displays, this could be anything, right? So this is a high level view on how you would need to architect your digital experience ecosystem around CMS. And there are some key things to keep in mind, some key requirements, first of all, really make sure that the systems that you're looking at are decoupled, so tightly coupled CMSs are not the right way to go, and that they have proper CMSs, at the, sorry, uh, APIs, both at the back end and the front end. And the other key requirement you need to look into, which you might actually overlook initially if you don't think about it, is what is the speed of those APIs? Because we started this webinar talking about contextual relevance, and in order to serve up a relevant experience, you need to have a sort of real-time response to what somebody's doing on your website or in a mobile app. So that means if you capture data points and you need to process what is the next best piece of information to show to the customer, that needs to happen in an instant, in milliseconds. So the performance and the way the system can scale and handle the load and respond within a few milliseconds is critical in order to deliver that contextual relevant experience. So there's a quite a few technical considerations without going too much into the technicalities of it, but these are things you need to, to look into when you construct your own digital marketing ecosystem. Now, from an SDL perspective, this is our bread and butter. We deliver technology, content management, and language technology. You've heard Mark talk about it, how this was implemented, for instance, at uh, Turkish Airlines. And the key CMS product that we uh, sell to, to support these type of scenarios is called SDL Trillion VX. And you see that we are serving a lot of the larger enterprises around the globe. Uh, 90 out of the top 100 brands use one or multiple products from STL. So by all means, if these scenarios make sense to you and this is the sort of challenges that you're dealing with, you can definitely work with Accelerate and STL to yeah, and engage with us to see how we can help you solve those problems. Now, this is all actually happening today, but I think, Mark, it would be interesting to take a brief look into the future as well. So um, if you want to enlighten us what you expect is going to happen in the future, that would be really great. Yeah, if only I had a glass bowl. Uh, so, yeah, we've talked about examples of good and bad customer experiences and how an organization like Turkish Airlines is trying to achieve a better customer experience in the present. And you already took us to the future uh, where we said it's all going to federated environments. But what about the future of the experiences? Well, to us, the future of experiences is real-time translation and real-time localization. Now, these are both needed to leverage the authenticity part. It's about real-time personalization needed to increase relevancy. But it is also about real-time generation generation of content. What will be happening is that content will be able to generate itself in real time. And 
this is a concept that has been part of the five future states of content that SDL talked about last year. And if you haven't read it, I definitely can recommend the ebook. I believe it's in the uh, in the links to this webinar. So be ready to uh, to download your copy of it. And making the experience real time will be the ultimate way of delivering an authentic and relevant experience with context as the main focus. As the content is not being created upfront, it can adapt to the actual context of the current visit, and this will help converting the visitor into a customer. And real-time content generation is not only a vague ID, it's something that is already experimented with by, for instance, Accelerate. And we already have working demos, for instance, for the example of the hotel description, which was shown by me earlier in this webinar, where the content is generated on the fly based on the context of the flight that was booked. Utilizing real-time principles will dictate a different approach to personalization. And if we go back to the present, currently we use persona-based personalization, which means we define criteria and we categorize visitors in one of many defined personas. And then for each persona, we have pre-authored content uh, consisting of images, greetings, products and services, and so on. And based on the persona, we will serve the content that we define as the best fit for that persona. But personalization will grow to the next level. If we abandon pre-authored content and use content generation in real time, while incorporating real personal characteristics of the visitor. And there are already examples where IBM Watson, for instance, is able to identify characteristics of persons and organizations, like you see displayed here on this slide. IBM Watson uses online data streams, like social media channels, to characterize you as a person, and possibly even the mood you're in. And Think about the possibilities that this will create for personalized ads based on your personal characteristics and the mood you're in at a specific moment in time. By leveraging real-time characteristics, we can abandon the pre-authoring of content based on the personas, and we can start to provide a real-time customer experience with real-time translation, localization, personalization, and content generation. And AI will be the driver of combining the real-time data with the products and services that we want to promote. And then if you feed back the journey analytics back into the AI engine in order to self-improve, you will start to create even better content the next time around. And I would say that is enough food for thought for now. Well, thanks, Mark. That's indeed uh, plenty of food for thought. So what, what I would like to do right now is just summarize some of the key things we discussed here on this webinar, and then we'll open up the floor for questions and answers. So we've been talking about clearly the importance of contextual relevance, and I think we, we all relate to that, that we don't want to waste our time with any sort of experience. It just needs to make sense to us, and any second lost on, uh, while we're online is, is one second too much, right? Key in that contextual relevance is, is content. Today, it's, it's pre-authored. It's created by humans. We will definitely see a shift towards more AI-generated content, automatic uh, natural language generation, NLG, as it's called officially. And that content and the delivery will need to be real-time. Otherwise, it's not contextual. Otherwise, it can't be relevant enough. I mean, there is, of course, a gliding scale. There's a scale from one size fits all to ultimate contextual relevancy that everybody that we talk to, all the organizations are trying to improve on that scale. And ultimately, that needs to be the real-time experience that we're all hoping to get. To get there, there is no single solution. And also, there is no simple solution. It's quite complex to get there. And it will probably take a lot of experimentation. It will require you to try systems and maybe swap them out in one or two years from now. And in order to have that business agility, you really need to think about what ways 
of integration does this product have? Can I plug it into my existing infrastructure? How easy can I integrate it with the rest of my uh, marketing tool set? If it works, we'll keep it. If it doesn't do the right job, we'll swap it out with something else. And that should not sort of undermine the overall platform that you're building. All of those platforms, um, they're too big to swap out in one go. So bit by bit, you should be able to, to plug new pieces in and to unplug all the pieces that no longer serve their purpose. And through that, that's how you build an agile technology ecosystem. So that's really the sort of key takeaway that we'd like to uh, talk about here today. Make sure you continue to be agile and that you're not locked in into this monolithic big enterprise system that uh, can only be updated once every decade and it's costing you a fortune. And with that, Kate, I would like to open up the floor for questions. If you can check if any questions came in already. And for those of you who might have questions at this point, please drop them also into the Q&A box and we can address them on the call here. Great, thanks Arian, um, and thanks Mark for presenting today. As Arian just said, we'll open up to any questions that come in, so please put, pop them in the Q&A box. Um, we have already got a few come in, so um, we'll just start running through those. Um, I think the first one is for you, Mark. Um, you mentioned that in the future, content will be generated on the fly. What does this mean for content managers? Oh, uh, they'll be out of a job. No, that, I'm, I'm kidding. I, I, I actually think that the role of the content management organization will, will shift. Uh, it will shift towards a responsibility to train the engines that will handle the content generation. Because the engines will not know uh, how to generate the content by itself. They, they always need to keep learning in order to, in the best way, generate the content for a specific visitor in that contextual and relevant manner and at least for the foreseeable future people will still have a role in checking the quality of the output and to improve on the output okay great thank you um, I've got another one what's your view on headless versus traditional ah uh, that's well, that will always depend on your needs. Um, so what I, what I would say is that you need to look at this from a strategy first approach. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with traditional approach uh, if you have limited channels to push your content to, and if you have limited number of integrations with other systems, then the traditional approach could work well. But the more flexibility you need and the more channels you're trying to serve and the more tools you have in your marketing technology stack, uh, that will add the need to go headless, to be more flexible in the final experience that you will deliver. Uh, and ideally, you would choose a technology tool set that supports both traditional and headless scenarios. I mean, the, the one doesn't rule out the other. Hope that answers it. Great, thank you. Um, another one that's come in is, how realistic is the future vision? For example, how will you foresee to surface real-time inventory on UI? I can try that one, uh, Kate. So I'm not sure I fully get the, the gist of the question, but if you think about real-time inventory on the UI, I mean, a lot of e-commerce shops, of course, do that today. You see how many items are still in stock on the UI if you buy something on an e-commerce website. So I don't think that is uh, that, that is necessarily the future that's happening today. Of course, there's a whole uh, backend infrastructure that is required to enable that. There's a large ERP story that needs to be told there and that needs to be implemented to get this to work. So um, it's, a, it's a big task for sure, but this is what a lot of organizations are doing these days already to show how many items are on inventory and that is then serviced up to the customer in real time. But I hope I got the question I understood the question right. If it, the question or if the person asking it meant something else, please ping us and we'll try to address it uh, after this uh, webinar. Okay, another question that's come in is, if the content is generated on real time, every time it can deliver different versions of the same content based on contextual relevancy and authenticity, how will you validate the content before delivery? 
Yeah, you you wouldn't, uh, but you also wouldn't uh, uh, go in this blind. I mean, the whole process to go to automatic content generation is by training the engine, uh, and this takes thousands, tens of thousands of pieces of content. For instance, in the hotel description, you would feed it enormous amounts of hotel descriptions to be absolutely sure that it understands what it needs to produce. And then when you have a, a, a satisfied feeling about the quality of the content generation, that's the moment that you would go online with, uh, with such a technology. Yeah, Mark, it's actually answer. quite an interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting question because I think we see that, of course, across the board with applications of AI. I mean, cameras these days have facial recognition. We we see all these sort of new use cases emerge for AI, and every time now and then you see also the worst applications of AI, where AI, AI makes the wrong decision and you get into a very compromising situation or something else. So I don't think the process will ever be flawless because the computer, in the end, the response that you're getting, it's as good as the data that you. Put it put in at the front. Uh, there's definitely a lot of testing that's going on, uh, but I think in some cases the machine will get it wrong. Ideally, what you would at least have for your customers is to have the ability to provide feedback so that you can train the system better and learn from your mistakes. Uh, but with any AI implementation, this is indeed an issue that you will need to think about. How can we train it? How can we test it? How can we create a feedback loop that solves the issue in the long run? Yeah, absolutely. And and even to add on top of that, you wouldn't immediately use content generation for all of your content on your website. I think the technology is starting to be able to uh, to support micro content, so small pieces of specific content. And the smaller the piece of content is, the smaller the error margin is that you would get. And over the years, this technology will absolutely evolve, making it also applicable to larger pieces of content. Yeah, and that's an interesting topic, by the way, because the smaller pieces of content are also easier to translate by the machine with less errors, uh, we, especially with newer machine translation. We've seen a lot of improvements over the last couple of years in terms of the quality of the output. So um, it's not just about the generation of that content. It's also about the automated translation of that content by neural machine translation. Uh, but I think we're heading in a direction where some of it might still be a bit early days, but a lot of this technology is maturing really, really fast. And within a few years from now, everybody will think it's quite normal for a machine to generate content, whereas right now we might still think it's a bit far-fetched. But it's not. It's happening today, and we'll see a lot more of that happening in the next couple of years. Okay, Kate, maybe any other questions? Let's yeah, see. we've just... We've got a couple more that have just come in as well. How can I implement the principles like contextual relevancy, interoperability, and real time? OK, well, let me take that. Um, the, the principles in itself are not, a, are not a goal in itself. And like we discussed during the webinar, you have to rethink your content. So first, you need to understand where you can actually deliver a better experience. And then you need to understand how you'll be able to deliver that experience. And maybe you need to get data from different systems, or you need to deliver your experience through different channels. If you understand what you need to do, you'll then evaluate the tools that will help you. And if you if you uh, uh, uphold the key principles like uh, like Aryan discussed, then that will help you implement this over time. Hope I answered that satisfactory. I think so. Great, thank I hope you. so. Yep, I think so. Um, and it looks like we've just got one final question. When you mention interoperability, what exactly do you mean by that? Okay, well, I'll take that one because I've been talking about it extensively here. So, I mean, interoperability in, in general, of course, it's the notion of systems are able to communicate and to talk to one another. Um, and if you think about how systems do that these days, usually it's through what is called RESTful APIs. It's, it's a technology protocol that enables systems to talk to one another, 
via HTTP, so basically via the web. So it means not everything needs to be within your firewalls and physically connected by cables. Systems can be distributed across the globe, and they can still talk to each other through these RESTful APIs. We also see newer ways of communication emerge, for instance, GraphQL, something that was invented by Facebook, um, which is a much efficient, much more efficient way of well, retrieving content or data sets and sending it back and forth between systems. Uh, but the reality will also, yeah, I mean, not all these systems that are in use these days, and especially the larger transactional systems like in banks, those are quite often still legacy systems where there is something that in place that we call batch processing. So large data sets are processed maybe once a day or twice a day, and then these large bulks of data are being copied across from one system to the next. So there's different ways you can think about interoperability and the real-time nature versus the batch processing nature. But the bottom line in the end is that you don't have to copy and paste content across or manually export and import it. The systems are handling it. They are the ones that are sort of receiving information or sending information to other systems. And in the end, that is what is needed to create, first of all, better operational efficiency within the organization to eliminate copy and paste and other activities from your employees and to create best and better customer experiences that are more real-time and more personal and more relevant. So that's the whole notion of interoperability that we talked about here today. Great. Thank, uh, thank you, Ari. And we've actually just got two further questions that have literally just come in, so we'll just quickly go through those two. Uh, the first one is, what are the most surprising shifts in skills or new skills have you seen in connection with these new strategies? Uh, I could take this from a technological perspective. Um, so, so what we see is that uh, programming languages become less important because uh, all applications provide APIs and, and can be coupled uh, uh, indifferent of the programming language uh, uh, at the bottom. And we see a shift uh, a need for more resources uh, that are able to deliver the web application. So uh, creating the digital experience from out of the content hub and integrating all the, uh, uh, all the data touch points from different systems. And of course, where we talked about machine learning and AI, the data engineers are becoming more and more important uh, over the years. Yeah, I think that's a very good point that you're addressing there, Mark, because the whole notion of marketing being the creative guys and IT being the techies, I think, is going to go away. If you look at how organizations need to blend the marketing and the IT skills to address all these challenges, I think that's where you will also see shifts in skills and also the way organizations put together teams, because you're going to need that marketing and IT uh, yeah, audience to, to work to intend them and to really solve these challenges together. Um, so I think that's where you also see organizations morph and also new functions and new roles emerge, like the chief data officer or the not the CMO or the CTO, but the chief marketing technology officer and things like that. So I think that's another organizational shift. And then the marketers need to become more data-driven, like you just said. So it's technically, yes, they need to have that skill set, but also the marketers themselves need to better understand technology and being able to interpret data and then respond accordingly. Good question. Thanks, guys. We've just got one final question that's just come in. What developments are emerging that you are tracking most closely now that you are not sure how they will play out? So, Mark, if anything jumps to mind on your end, but yeah, well, I, I mean, what what we uh, within Accelerate are are very much focused on is is what we've presented here. So, the uh, machine learning, the machine translation, and the uh, AI parts for both translations and content generation. And I mean, I've presented a possible future, uh, but. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how that will play out. So that's the most important one that we are monitoring at the moment. Yeah, I'm not sure I would have anything other to add to that as well. I think it's the application of AI and machine learning throughout any sort of technology. 
I mean, we've talked about content here today and experiences, but AI is embedded already in machines all over the place, your home appliances, any sort of device. It's quite likely that there will be some sort of narrow AI in it that does a very specific task really well. What we'll probably see is that the role of AI can expand to be more broader in terms of the scope of what it's able to do. But it also means that we will see new applications and new things emerge. And then there are, of course, new ethical questions and a whole other type of uh, questions that you will start asking yourself in terms of what can AI do, what is it allowed to do, how much control should we hand over to AI. So I think that's the really the, the big question for the next decade might be where does this AI thing go and how do we keep control of it. Okay, lovely. That's the last of the questions. We don't have any other questions. So um, I think we'll, we'll finish there. So um, thanks everybody for attending the webinar. Um, don't forget to visit the attachments and links sections for more information and some useful um, links. Um, the recording will be available here on Bright Talk straight after the webinar, but we'll also be sending a copy to everyone who's registered. We hope you found today's session useful, and we look forward to welcoming you again to one of our next webinars. Just have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>